Okay, so now we go to the real, I mean, no, no they are both real, but uh, this one is the, the one that we, we gather here for Mario Bellini. A very successful, uh, in fact, uh, more successful than I thought. If by success we mean, uh, we mean, uh, you know, uh, someone who built a lot and he became, I think initially he became successful uh, and, and notorious as a designer. <clears throat> I will end with his designs, both, uh, you know, furniture designs and object design or industrial design. But I start with him as an architect. Mario Bellini, he's 85 years old today. Happy birthday, Mario Bellini. So Mario Bellini, born February 1st, 1935 in Milan, is an Italian architect and designer. He graduated from the Milan Polytechnic, the Faculty of Architecture in 1959, and began working as an architect himself in the early 60s. He's the winner among others of eight Compasso d'Oro and prestigious architecture awards, including the Medaglia d'Oro conferred on him by the president of the Italian Republic. Like many other Italian architects, his activities range from architecture and urban planning to product and furniture design, as it should be, I think. Uh, a good architect can also do planning and uh, urban planning and even rural planning if uh, rurality accepts planning uh, and also design, furniture design or uh, product design. Here is the man uh, and I have a few other pictures with him. Uh, here he is, I, I particularly like him in this picture. He's uh, intense and uh, I would say handsome uh, for uh, whatever his age here is. And I like that scarf, which Europeans wear so gracefully. I was never able to, to wear one as gracefully as I tried, but I, I feel it feels strange for me because I didn't grow in such a culture, uh, but, but uh, in Italy, everybody has the scarf like this or in France or in, usually in Europe. Um, I could do it too. I have such scarf, but I don't know. I feel it as if it is not me. So I, in the end, I throw the scarf away. Hello, Mr. Um, Botelli, uh, happy birthday again to you. Uh, and now he's probably approaching the age he's actually he, now, meaning 85, 85 years old today. The architects live long lives, that's for, that's for sure. I mentioned Frank Gehry, over 90, maybe almost 95. Doshi, 93 or so. Alvaro Siza, 94. Alkenneth Frampton, 90. Uh, Eisenman, 88, it's unbelievable. You know, these people live forever. Uh, without doubt of all professions, I think architects live the longest. And poets, the least. <laughs> poets die very young, you know, poor poets, you know, but they live intensely. Those few years, they live very intensely. But architects know how to take care of themselves, uh, usually, unless they die in a war like Santelia. Drawings, <clears throat> drawings by Mr. Uh, Botelli. Uh, uh, it's curious drawings in a way, if you look at it, you know, it's, I don't know if it was done for a real commission, but he was 80 when he did this sketch in 2015. You know, those protrude, protruding uh, prisms within, uh, inside a, a cylinder, and then some strange uh, silhouettes there doing, I don't know what, uh, maybe it was some kind of a surrealist, uh, Il Progetto, Progetto Infinito. Uh, I see a reference to the Tower of Babel there. So maybe it was just a, you know, a so-called poetical uh, sketch that he did in a moment of uh, questioning human existence. Who knows? Uh, study for a table. You are going to see this table, actually, he built it. Um, other chairs, he built a lot of chairs. Aesthetics, you see, 2015, 80 years old. Ah, very active, and he's still active at 85. Uh, here is another kind of a drawing for a Tokyo design. <clears throat> I like to begin after a few pictures with drawings because, you know, the drawings are a path towards, uh, towards the building. Uh, another chair, this was also built 
uh, very elegant. Uh, it looks simple, but it's not simplistic. It's actually very complex. Uh, and um, the complexity maybe is a little bit hidden. This is a, a project uh, for, a, for a museum that you are going to see. Uh, other nervous sketches, well, relatively nervous. But I see the spiral there, which uh, insinuates itself with some uh, uh, interest into the drawing. And I wonder why, because I didn't really see uh, works that use the spiral, but uh, they are present on the sketch. Maybe it will happen. Mario Bellini, uh, Italian uh, <laughs> beauty. Well, you know, I don't know if he's is because of his beauty as a person or uh, his work. I imagine it's about his work. Anyway, this one, I have a few works where I took the, 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 the name of the work from Wikipedia, but then when I went to his website, I saw the, the title, the name a little different. This is from Wikipedia, the first work I saw from 1985, 1990, and this is from his website. This is the same thing. Except that here is a thermoelectrical power plant where I only saw what looked, looked like uh, offices. So I, I trust in the end uh, the titles on his website, which is, well, I, I suggest to you, if you are interested in his works, to open up his uh, website and it's very well organized. So uh, anyway, new office, it means Cassano Dada, uh, at that time, um, I, I would say there is a little bit of influence from the, 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 the infamous uh, postmodernism, not as alarming as it is in other cases for other architects, but still uh, something is there that, that bothers me a little bit. Is, but I know that at that time, I, 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 it was a very difficult time for architecture some kind of a nostalgia for, for the past and that nostalgia gave birth to, you know, uh, questionable uh, architectural gestures. Here is still modernist, but you see these tribes, you know, they make me think a little bit of Mario Botta and other architects. It's a little bit of uh, deja vu, a little bit. But, but he's a versatile architect and you'll see he changed and he's been, he's able to, to negotiate with his time uh, quite actively. So it's, it's not, a, there are some slight elements of mannerism, a little bit, just a little bit, but not as much as uh, like, for example, in the case of uh, Mario Botta. Mario Botta is very easily recognizable uh, because of his maniera, but um, uh, Mario Botelli is uh, different. Um, so a little bit different, um, but again, it, it, it was the time, uh, the, you know, between the eighties and the nineties, this was kind of, even James Sterling was resolutely a modernistic architect after he, uh, uh, you know, around that uh, time, uh, he began to, uh, uh, I don't know, to, to become a little bit uh, populistic and uh, his architecture became, uh, uh, I don't know, a little questionable in my opinion, maybe more than a little. And I'm talking about a major force in British architecture, James Sterling. Um, so we move forward, but we still see signs of resolute modernity or modernism like, like here. Um, some, some sketches for this. Uh, he built some very large uh, buildings uh, in Milan and not just in Milan, you will see some more. Uh, and um, I guess he, he was uh, capable of inspiring his clients with uh, continuing to receive commissions. The, the Erba Exhibition and Congress Center, another Congress Center, 1986-1990, uh, this is the naming on his website. The other one was on, uh, on Wikipedia. Uh, a good craftsman, you know, these Italians uh, craft very well, either a chair or a table or uh, even a camera. <laughs> Japanese is true, but still the designer Italian or a building. They are skillful. 
Uh, if I am to point again, you know, is that unfortunate period uh, in European and not only European architecture, and you see he built a lot in Japan. If it, there is something here that a clan date was the past, was history. And then you have here an architecture that almost says no to, to history. But this is a little bit historicist for my taste. A little bit, it's, it's hard actually to combine masonry wall with a, a steel and glass uh, uh, structure. But there are positive surprises like this one is, 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 is magnificent. No, it's, it's modernistic yet, you know, I think someone from the past would have, uh, would have appreciated as much as we do. Uh, you see what, what it is. Uh, but even here, this kind of centrality, and, and you will see in his later works that he gave up on this because times changed. But at uh, that time, I think he didn't make, uh, you know, mistakes like other architects did, uh, seduced, being seduced by uh, historicism. Um, uh, Italy is, as you know, is a very potent uh, country in the field of uh, art in general and architecture in particular. Here is the building, uh, and we just saw this, uh, you know, from underneath uh, what, what this is outside. Uh, it, it's a good building, uh, you know. I don't know how this villa was able to pay for this building, but I don't know what kind of an institution that is. So this is a Congress hall and, and there are others um, that he built uh, and not just in, in Italy. But this is not bad with, with that except with that, uh, you know, reticence relating in my opinion to the, uh, the conjunction or the tension between two different kinds of attitudes, one forward looking and one a little bit uh, nostalgic, I would say, towards the past, plus this centrality, you know, the strong axis. Uh, you know, once we stepped into the 21st century, very few people would design in this way. But I, I still think it's a valuable building. Now he is no doubt a, a skillful designer. Too bad, again, this is a little bit uh, cliche. You know, we have seen things like this in Michael Graves and other architects at that time. And it's just unfortunate that, you know, this kind of, you know, entering into entrance into a temple or uh, uh, even Isozaki in Japan did it. Uh, it was the time and it was in the air and that was kind of mainstream. And, you know, some people gave in uh, a little bit. But there are here things also that are original and they resist the test of time, the passing of time. I'm referring to this. This is just too unsurprising and, uh, you know, a little bit uh, cliche, a little bit too easy, in my opinion. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry, Mario, if you allow me to call you on your first name. And that's because I have difficulties too. With a, with a last name, because it's so close to another uh, name that uh, is, does not belong to, to an artist or an architect, by, but uh, to a soccer player. Although when I, when I worked in Rome for Paolo Portoghesi, I have to tell you, I learned the Italians are fanatic. Well, maybe you know about soccer. You know, they would come to work. Uh, in the morning and for a few hours, they will talk just about soccer, about the game that happened uh, the previous day. And I'm talking about inside an architecture office, they were supposed to work, right? Not to comment on the a certain, you know, moment in a certain game. Anyway, they love soccer, that's true. Uh, too bad I have to use this North American word, which is so inappropriate, you know, soccer. Why isn't it called football? And it's not. It's not because they have their own football, which is uh, almost grotesque in my opinion. Uh, but uh, what can you do? Anyway, moving forward with uh, this Congress Hall uh, by Mario Botelli. Uh, this is in Japan. He built a few buildings in Japan, and this is one of them. is a business park. I, I, I don't quite like these two words together, a business park. You know, <laughs> I mean, I don't know. It's, it's, 
how could it be a park if it is a business? You know, and how could it be a business if it is a park? I mean, it's, it's, it's I understand he and there is there is skill here, but you see the historicism behind the, the, the scheme. You know, yes, uh, he's skillful. He plays this uh, you know piece of water, and there are reflections, and you almost uh, become romantic. But uh, the realities of it all uh, are not so romantic. And we are talking about a business, business. I repeat, ladies and gentlemen, business part whatever that might mean. I guess it means that it's a place where, you know, businessmen gather and they, they strike deals because that's what businessmen do in a pleasant environment. But to me, it's something I would rather stay away from. But that's because I'm not a businessman, but maybe if I was, I would have liked it. He built several of these. Now, what that child is doing there with the umbrella, I don't know. That's what I meant, you know, we saw Jovara splendors for the king uh, or the church. Here we see splendors for the corporate world, for the business people, you know. Uh, who are these business people? You know, these are people who aim having a profit. That's, that's what they are. And I don't know, uh, if I was a bush or a tree or grass or flowers, I would tell them to move away <laughs> if I was uh, not too harsh. Tokyo Design Center in Tokyo. So, you know, Tokyo does know about design. Japan does know about design, but they commissioned uh, the Italian architect to, um, to design for them, the Tokyo Design Center. And here we see again these uh, thick walls that are probably not, not, not as thick as they appear, uh, but uh, as some kind of a, you know, monumental uh, postmodernist here at work, which uh, disturbs me so much. Um, but fortunately, there are other things. I mean, you know, uh, sloping roofs with the, with the flags at the top, this is a trademark of postmodernism. Uh, we, we we know better these days, but we we look at the plan. Uh, the plan is interesting with this uh, passage, you know, this uh, uh, huge uh, stair uh, that that goes through the building all the way. It's, it, it, it's an interesting. Uh, I imagine is a, is an interesting, uh, uh, you know, uh, feature. Anyway. Um, I kind of like more these buildings, which are traditional, but uh, I, I don't know, they have an authenticity that uh, cannot be denied and cannot be ignored. This, this is what bothers me, the, the, this, 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 this static, actually, this architecture that postmodernism uh, influenced. But he has, fortunately, also betrayals you know, with steel and, uh, you know, diagonal uh, passages. Uh, I don't know very well what's going on here, actually, because it doesn't really seem to be a, a walkable bridge. But anyway, uh, so he's in Japan. Japan also uh, flirted with postmodernism in dangerous ways. Like if you, if you look at the work done by Kenko, Kuma around that time, you won't believe your eyes. You just won't believe your eyes, as I didn't believe my eyes. I know, Kengo Kuma recognized later in a recent interview that he made his mistakes when he was younger. He certainly did. In fact, uh, unbelievable, colossal. <laughs> uh, what can you do? It was the end of the millennium. There was uh, malaise, a malaise in the world. There was pessimism. Uh, so we had to look backwards and uh, you know, inspire ourselves from, uh, from the past. And uh, we chose the, you know, the unconvincing road. That is the road of uh, you know, often actually pastiche. And <laughs> pastiche is never true creation, never. Anyway, we saw this one. Now, now we are in a new fair district of the Milan 
In my opinion, this period in his work is, is not at its best. The International Milan Trade Fair, or TELO, as, as it is called on his website, uh, we kind of recognize him here as well. You know, uh, a decent architecture, I mean, with a certain uh, level of so-called power, and all for the better is the presence of the vegetation. But otherwise, it's a little bit still uh, passeistic, with the exception maybe of this, uh, I don't know, the glass towers with a, with a stair, uh, those, um, those are interesting maybe at night even better. Uh, but when he, when he uses technology, you know, like uh, pieces like this, he becomes more convincing and more vigorous. Um, and um, yeah, I don't know. I think, I think again that around that time uh, he didn't really collapse, but other, other architects did collapse. It was a, but look at this building, it's huge. My God, my God. I mean, you know, even the Chinese probably would be envious of what, uh, you know, uh, Mario did here in this uh, great uh, Italian uh, city, Milan. Milan, which still has the, the ambition to be a, you know, a forward looking uh, city in Europe and the world, very, very, uh, you know, uh, obstinate in, 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 in this desire. And to go just to go beyond even, you know, being well known by for design and, and fashion, uh, it wants to show also muscles in the field of industry, business. Uh, so it's a very uh, active city in this in this sense. I like this picture at night because the you know the passeistic structures are a little bit sub subdued, uh, not so much here, but more here. And this is what. Uh, even though the symmetry is a little bit uh, the end of the 20th century, but what can you do? You see it here in all this ensemble. He, he did this uh, large, large work. Uh, and it's, it's some kind of a corporate architecture that is uh, a productivist, but also has, uh, I use that uh, French expression, clin d'oeil, when you, I don't know very well how to translate that into English. You know, you make a gesture with your eyes, uh, of a, some kind of a complicity or sympathy towards someone or a certain issue. And here I see this, um, uh, you know, it doesn't want to irritate the past, but the function of the building is, is different from those uh, royal palaces that we saw earlier with Juvara. In, and not too far away because Turin is not far away from Milan. Uh, I wonder what Juvara would have would have uh, would have built if he lived today. And I wonder what you know, vice versa. It, it's, it would be an interesting. Maybe next year I will make a presentation on both, more uh, focused on on some kind of a dialogue between the two. Now uh, another building in Japan, some for a. Uh, company of cosmetics. Uh, this one I kind of like uh, it, because it is surprisingly fresh in its almost uh, international style, but almost because you see here some affectation, uh, you know, some uh, little bit of uh, theater of design. The, 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 this part of the facade is a little bit curved here, concave and convex, and, and you see a detail of that. Uh, also, it has some other parts which are kind of interesting, moderately interesting, but the problem again is that the clan do it towards historicism. Otherwise, you know, you see here um, kind of interesting things going on and they go with Japan, I would say, because Japan has a very um, intense uh, relationship with the geometry and even with a certain, you know, symbolism perhaps. I don't know about this, you know. It, Maybe yes, maybe not. But again, this was the time. Um, it's, it's something you see here, you know. It, it's kind of interesting. And you'll see this uh, also at the Louvre because he did a, um, the, um, uh, an architecture for the, the Islamic uh, art within the Louvre in Paris. And um, uh, he, he doesn't avoid the curves. 
in some special cases or special moments. And I think that's a good, I think this is a good thing. Uh, yeah, uh, we have seen this before, didn't we? With a, a circular scheme with water in the center and then, you know, columns, uh, it's fine. Natuzzi, America's headquarters, High Point, North Carolina. We are approaching the, the end of the 20th century and we see a little bit of goodbye to postmodernism here. This is a resolutely modernistic uh, uh, structure with a, a touch of expressionism. And, uh, but inside still that this kind of, uh, you know, corridor punctuated by the rhythm of thick columns, uh, which mimic, I imagine, masonry and um, yeah. Otherwise, no doubt he's a, he's a skillful architect, uh, but, but here in such uh, cases, uh, I think he's a little bit predictable. Uh, this is a drawing, a sketch of, of, of the building, which is in North, North Carolina, neither Europe nor Japan, it is in the United States, but it stands out if you compare all these buildings uh, to, to it. It does stand out, and it, st it stands out even more if you look at it from from this side. And we are going to see that uh, this is one picture, and I have uh, you know this one. Uh, I mean, you know, not, not North Carolina. They have buildings like this and not like this, and so you know, it was a clear departure from what uh, the so-called context uh, offered. But then, you know, between the two buildings is the large, not to say huge highway. So, you know, the context uh, is um, already polluted, so to speak, by the vehicular uh, circulation. Uh, drawing, I'm, I'm not sure is better than what Juvara drew, but uh, what can we do? It's, it's the 20th century, uh, almost the 21st century. This picture I kind of like because it's, it's like a well, uh, a geomet geometrized well in a way, or some kind of a, uh, I don't know why I'm thinking of a well because it doesn't really look like a well, but uh, you know, like, like some kind of a special animal that emerges from the water towards the sky you know, in, in all its glory and splendor that maybe the captain have uh, would have uh, appreciated from a distance, but only because he wanted to catch the whale that um, made him have just one leg. Uh, Essen uh, International Fair in Germany, we are stepping in the 21st century expansion of the Essen Fairgrounds, uh, another giant uh, building celebrating, of course, production, 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 and consumption, consumption, consumption. What can you do? We don't build for the kings, but we build for the corporations, for production. And look at them, you know, I mean, at one moment, I imagine all this area was filled with trees. Now it's filled with huge buildings, uh, probably with a lot of air conditioning, because when a building is so wide and so long, you need air conditioning, no doubt. So there is a lot of, you know, <laughs> Uh, energy consumption here and, uh, you know, by, as a consequence, uh, you know, the climate change is um, accelerating. What can we do? Uh, the age of man is gloriously underlining itself as indeed the age of man. There is a bird there, kind of solitary, but uh, um, it looks strange that bird there doesn't it? It's not its place. It's not her place there. It's not. This is this is uh, the citadel of man, uh, and man is the measure of all things. And forget about birds and animals and grass. No, this is the age of man. Um, yeah, the flags are also <laughs> announcing the place of events events not for the birds and animals and grass, but for man, man, and man. The age of Anthropocene, huge buildings, you know, built overnight almost. 
uh, and there are so many of these all over the world. I don't know about this. I mean, this is a little bit too sweet uh, for my taste. When you think about its function, yeah, that's a problem. When you have a convention center, you know, uh, you don't you don't try to romanticize it unnecessarily because its reality is of a di very different kind. So here is, uh, I think, it's still nostalgia for uh, for what we call the past. But he's at his best, I think when he forgets that nostalgia, like, like for example, in this new next work, uh, the National Gallery of Victoria in uh, Australia, extension and re redevelopment in Melbourne, Australia, 1996, 2003. Uh, you know, he, gave, he renounced, uh, well, here you have the artwork, so the architecture didn't have to uh, flirt with the past. The artworks do do that. Uh, otherwise, this I mean, this room is is I don't know. Maybe he, he received it like this. It is, doesn't show a lot of uh, intervention actually, but we'll see in other places his vigorous uh, intervention. Like here, for example, I like this diagonal opening into that that quasi wall, which is already transparent. Uh, and uh, it's kind of interesting where you have two levels of transparency, uh, you know, uh, uh, sabotage transparency, so to speak, and one that is not sabotaged. And uh, it, 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 I think this diagonal is interesting here. I don't know exactly, is it a stair there? I think it is because I think uh, I see a handrail here. So maybe it's, it's a sign that uh, says uh, the stair is, is, is here. Yes, at the escalator actually. But there is another one there. Maybe, maybe there, there was a stair there as well. Uh, but this interior is uh, mod modern through and through. And it has a right balance, I think, between opacity and transparency. There is uh, glass, but there are also, you know, uh, opaque towers, I mean, almost towers, uh, verticals, um, thick, uh, opaque walls. I like it. It's I don't know. Maybe this is a little bit capricious here. Or the functionalist would ask, why is it like this, like this? And uh, I don't know what is happening behind it. Maybe there is some kind of a, uh, you know necessity, so to speak, for it. But maybe we don't have to justify everything in terms of necessity. Also, I don't know very well what's going on here. But um, it's kind of interesting, you know, maybe a, cap a, a capricious gesture, you know, maybe. Uh, otherwise, the, the building, but it was a building that he didn't build, he just uh, made interventions within an existing building. Or maybe these rooms, uh, you know, belong to that um, older building. Uh, no, no, I, I continue to think that he's at his best when, when he's not uh, uh, nostalgic. When he becomes nostalgic, I think he weakens a little bit his architecture. Uh, but you will see he also did a lot of design. This man, if he just did designs, would have been enough. But he also built a lot, as you can see. So he was a famous designer. He is a famous designer, but also an architect who builds a lot. Um, and he still has some large works in during construction, which I am not going to show, but I, I'm going to show a few other important works by him. Radical refurbishment of the Deutsche Bank in Frankfurt. I'm not sure I saw, I, I, I have pictures of this. I do, I do, I, I have a few, and, but I, this one, I. Uh, I forgot there was a problem on his website. Um, at one point, his uh, newer projects probably are presented differently, and I got a little bit uh, unsure of what was going on. This is interesting, though, because he brings chaos in. I mean, there is a sphere, there is a um, you know geometry, uh, there is centrality, but there is also uh, it's a broken sphere, and and those two. Uh, bridges uh, break the sphere. So there is a dynamic, uh, um, you know, uh, architectural expression here that uh, 
is engaging and interesting. I don't know exactly why he did it, uh, but um, yeah, I guess sometimes, you know, you could, uh, I mean, there could be some symbolist, uh, you know, if you want to find some raison d'etre for it, uh, you know, uh, it's possible. I could venture to speculate, but I will abstain. Well, if it was just a sphere without being broken, I think it would have been less interesting. But now it is interesting exactly because it is broken, violated. The Museum of the City of Bologna uh, from 2004, 2012. Uh, so it's a newer work. This is an existing building, but you'll see what he did inside. He also did, of course, like any good architect, I actually don't know why we separate between interior architecture and architecture and urbanism. They should come together, you know, and a good architect can do all of them. Here you have a designer and an architect who does interior design quite convincingly. Uh, interesting this uh, detail, so to speak, where you have shelves for books and then you have this uh, artwork hanging there, you know, uh, in a way precariously with a, with a background that is, uh, uh, you know, uh, lit and, uh, you know, lightweight. There are interesting things here, uh, not to speak about this, you know. <laughs> I mean, uh, yeah, I, I, I think he's capable of surprising us. And uh, the Louvre also, he did an excellent work, you'll see. It. This is in Bologna. Uh, it's just, uh, you know, this is a country that is very, very potent in art and design and architecture, as you know, you saw Juvara before, I mean, we could mention tens of very important architects, uh, and uh, I'm not even mentioning the artists and so on. Italy is Italy. Uh, I like this, uh, this view here, you know, it's psychedelic. And in a way, uh, I mean, this relates with the old building, with the facade. You saw the facade, it's an old building. But uh, it's almost like a dialogue between him and, uh, and Jovara, although this is not in Turin. Uh, but uh, I, I like this ability the Italians have to, to uh, assume the past, sometimes, not always, to assume the past and then also accept the present and maybe even the future. Uh, an architect uh, who worked for Gucci uh, when I launched the competition, a new facade for San Lorenzo in Florence, he told me we in Florence are, are handicapped by the incredible history of the city and we cannot move forward, we are, we are paralyzed. And I could understand, what do you do when you are born in a culture so rich as uh, the Italian one is? You know, uh, it, it could be indeed uh, paralyzing. You know, how, how could you continue when, you know, looking to the left, you see Michelangelo, looking on the right, you see Bernini, looking forward, you see uh, Alberti, and looking backwards, you see Bramante or uh, Brunelleschi. I mean, but it should be possible, you know. I, 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 I had the same problem in, in, I mean, I noticed the same problem in Chicago. I went to live in Chicago for a few years to be in the proximity of the great masters. Frank Lloyd Wright, uh, Sullivan, Miss, but the level of greatness, sorry to say it in Chicago now is not the same as Wright was living there and building like crazy in Oak Park or Miss for that matter or Sullivan. So I guess there are periods in doesn't matter how great is the city or how big, uh, if there is a uh, creative activity, you cannot sustain that activity forever and ever and ever. Although Florence, as you know, had also avant-garde, uh, and um, you know there, there are interesting uh, architects. Uh, there were in the contemporary architects, um, Super Studio or even Michelucci. There were interesting, you know, almost contemporary architects. Uh, look at this. You know, it's 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 fine. It, it's a creation in an old room. He brings in. It's it's. It's architecture, but it's also graphic art, and it's it's uh, it's interior design, and you can do a lot if you are creative. You can uh, uh, create, uh, you know, a spectacular uh, 
arrangements uh, if you are not uh, thinking uh, conventionally. And I like what I see, you know, it's bi-dimensional art, enlarged, uh, you know, etched uh, drawings uh, populating the glass walls. Uh, I think it's interesting. The Museum of Islamic Arts at, at the Louvre in Paris, we are approaching the end of this uh, presentation. Uh, uh, hopefully next year I will make a larger one because I think he deserves it. Uh, I, may, I don't know, was he commissioned uh, for this important work at the Louvre or he won a competition, but I think he did an excellent work in a very sensitive and demanding place, a courtyard of the Louvre. Uh, we see a section and, uh, and uh, you know, obviously this is what he did. And I think he, he did it very well. Um, uh, again, a difficult context. In my opinion, he did better than I am paying. In my opinion, the, 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 the harsh symmetry of I am Pei's work uh, and also the explicitness of the glass pyramid. I think a pyramid uh, doesn't accept easily to be transparent because inevitably, inevitably you think of the pyramids, uh, you know, not just in Egypt, but you know, in some other countries as well, they are all opaque. In fact, they are cryptic. You know, they don't even have a door. So to make a pyramid that is made of glass, to me is as problematic as the glass uh, dome that Foster built in, in Berlin uh, above, the, above the Reichstag. Uh, maybe I'm a little bit of a purist or uh, I don't know very well how to describe myself, but I think both the glass dome and the glass pyramid are a, a little bit questionable. Uh, and, uh, um, you know, uh, because the pyramid is, 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 a, is, a, is a symbol of centrality. Yes, the Louvre was connected with, uh, with, the, with uh, the emperors, with the kings of France. It's true, but did the Louvre need a pyramid there? Yes, he made it of glass. But uh, the truth is, if you are inside, and I had been inside, uh, once you descend, uh, you know, the, the stairs and so on, uh, you are the inferior level, just like here, but there you feel you are in an airport, actually. Here, uh, I don't think you can, this one I didn't see, this was built uh, after I, um, I, left, uh, I left Paris, but uh, I think, and plus this is, I think this Italian architect and designer was wise. He didn't try to, amplify the, the already existing and, and high level of centrality, which the museum, the old museum uh, represents so powerfully. He introduced, uh, he served uh, harmony through contrast. So he uh, brought, brought in this, uh, this fluidity, this uh, roofing that is uh, more feminine and less strict. It's true also, it was a little bit later than uh, what IMP did, but I think he was wiser than IMP because he created this uh, envelope uh, at the top that is, uh, as I said, is not, is not, is not uh, uh, doubling the, 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 stat the, the rigidity of the geometrical scheme that the museum already had. It tried to add a different value and this is the value. And I think he, he did very well. Uh, and I'm happy uh, the, the Louvre accepted the proposal and built it. In a way, he also brought nature, but it's, it's an artificialized nature. It's not really a hill, it doesn't have grass on it, but it, you understand that the, the old building somehow is enhanced by the, by the gesture, uh, 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 you know, uh, creating the space for the Islamic uh, art within. Also, we could also think a little bit uh, symbolically, you know, hey, it's, it's interesting uh, what he did and I, I, I sympathize with this work. Um, I imagine if he built another pyramid here or a tower or I, I don't know, I, I, I think he chose, uh, he chose correctly. And there are, there are spectacular things here too, you know, this uh, uh, double shell and uh, 
you know, very well crafted. Uh, I think I think is one of his best best uh, best works. It's also the, the 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 dialogue, the tension between the old world and the new. You have transparency, you have opacity, you have massivity on the right side, and you have fragility on the left. Uh, the interior is maybe a little, a little bit predictable. Uh, you know, it even relates to an extent with the pyramid uh, by IMP, except that here is not a pyramid. But this glass, I don't know. I think here he could have done more, maybe to cover that glass, to 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 problematize it, maybe with some textiles or I don't know. It would be a little more complex. Uh, I think, like like here, it's good that he has this part, but here, uh, you know, is in a in a dangerously predictable uh, uh, field, I think. But but this uh, curtain, you know, this uh, poro uh, porous um, you know uh, shell, I think is more interesting than than what what goes on here. It's a prestigious work, you know, to build in the courtyard of the Louvre. <laughs> you know, it's a dream job and a difficult job. Uh, here, what can we say? You know, stairs and, and escalators, I mean, especially escalators are difficult to negotiate with because they are, they are what they are. And, uh, <laughs> you know, you, you can make them too creative. I didn't see very creative escalators. I don't know why, you know, they should be, I don't know, they are all uh, rigid and all the same, you know, it's like, there must be a way, maybe this is an interesting uh, subject to explore, you know, to invent new kinds of escalators that are not so predictably and so obviously escalators. Um, the interior, I mean, you know, there are great artworks here, as you can see, and, um, also, the idea to show uh, horizontally, you know, uh, either carpet, carpets or uh, I don't know what they are, is a good idea, is an interesting idea. So to move away from the walls, well, there are displays on the walls as well, but uh, look at the, the, the floors. Uh, it's, uh, I think it's, a, it's an interesting idea. As a whole, the whole scheme is rather horizontal, and that's a good thing. Now we arrive at another work, the Milan Convention Center, a huge work. In fact, it's written for all to see. Europe's largest convention center, 2008, 2012. Uh, and here, I think he, he, I don't know if it was built exactly as he intended it, but uh, the intention was, was, uh, was excellent. I mean, uh, in, in, in terms of expressivity, uh, it, it is, uh, of course, it, it is also uh, not really a fashion, but it's in the air. Other architects work with, you know, with, uh, with folded architectures, with, uh, you know, works that mimic uh, fabrics or, uh, you know, woven work, uh, textiles, uh, embroideries and so on. Uh, but I think he did it with verb and with lyricism and also with a certain level of discretion and, and uh, reticence. Uh, I don't know if it was built exactly as uh, you see pictures and maybe you can tell me. Here we see on the pavement, uh, uh, you know, the, new, the graphic neurosis of our time. Uh, Daniel Lipskind also used it uh, at the Jewish Museum in uh, in, uh, in Berlin, uh, and uh, yeah, there are some concessions to the spirit of the time, so to speak. Uh, but uh, I think the way he handled the roof is is uh, is good because uh, also you know, as opposed to let's say Frank Gehry in Bilbao, for example, here he has two systems that 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 are in a conflictual dialogue. And this creates a, a, an additional dy dynamic. Uh, it's a dynamic configuration, exactly because he, he assumes, uh, if I am to express myself in this way, two systems. And uh, look at it, it's, it's, it's very well crafted. And 
you know, uh, rather spectacular. I, I think he did a good job. Uh, maybe here uh, you'll see, uh, I, ho I hope other pictures is maybe a little bit predictable, but this, uh, you know, a tablecloth, so to speak, thrown on top of the building is uh, interesting. I don't know about this bulbous uh, structure here, which he also used in that building in Japan, but inside the building. But I like what, I mean, I am subjective. Uh, I, I like what I see here. I think this is the uh, skillfully uh, projected and skillfully done. And in the, in the, I imagine this is a rendering now. Uh, sometimes it's hard to tell. But uh, I like what I see here. You know, it's a very, you know, it's almost like the the, the spring by Botticelli is a, is a light-hearted spirit that salutes the light, the sky, and the lyricism of life. And in opposition with it, uh, you know, the grayness, although dynamical and metallic, and uh, it's an interesting uh, conjunction. But my preference is still for this. Uh, so, it's almost like the revenge of text to weave, you know, what I see here, I see the two parts of the word architect or architecture. At the bottom, arch, man, masculinity. At the top, text, I mean, texture, which comes from text, which means to weave and uh, I would say this is the, the femininity of architecture, which takes over. So symbolically, I would see here the 21st century, because I have a book myself published in, in, in France with the title, uh, the 21st century, uh, the century of women. Well, <laughs> that's what we see here. It is the century of women. They take over and the masculine world is, has to accept it. Uh, because uh, it will be, I think, a betterment of life and perhaps of our tool of creativity. Uh, we need a feminine to assert itself or herself more and more. So welcome to the world of text. And I, uh, this is my favorite picture, this view, this particular view of this building, you know. But, you know, this is also in a way an abstraction or a symbolization of nature you know, hill and, uh, you know, the less geometry, more fluidity, uh, although it is uh, sculptured here, it has also a little bit of, uh, uh, it, it's not like, for example, similar attempts in a way by Ishigami in a competition he won in China, but was not built. This is a, it's also a little bit angular and a little bit sculptural, I like it very much in, in this particular uh, uh, view. Otherwise, what we see here is very similar to, in fact, I, I think this, this probably was built above his own work that we saw earlier, built, uh, I don't know, 30 years ago or so. And, uh, you know, that's, yeah, it is the building which he built and he covered it now, he brought it to a different sensibility. Which I think it was uh, was a good uh, a, a good gesture is a good gesture, and this is a you know a drawing, uh, you know the tumultuousness that, uh, of the road not taken uh, is the tumultuous of uh, of uh, womanhood of femininity of text of weaving uh, of the textile, uh, you know bringing bringing in something new and uh, much much needed I would say. And this, you know, I think, I imagine this is the hand of a, of a lady. And uh, what we see here is also, in my opinion, uh, feminine. So it's a good, uh, we welcome this gesture. Uh, I welcome it. Now some furniture designs and industrial design. He, he was a prodigious, he is a prodigious designer. He did a lot of uh, chairs and sofas and, uh, but not just that. And, some of them we, you know, manufactured by some of the most important uh, manufacturers of today, luxurious, I mean, Italians are notorious for uh, crafting uh, innovative uh, designs. This is a famous chair by him. Uh, 
uh, and I like the way it is presented, you know, dramatically with a with a Latin touch in a way. There is a drama there, even in the in the in the in the, in the picture, the presentation of the object. Um, this is the chair, all leather. Can you imagine? Uh, I mean, uh, I imagine it's not the least expensive chair in the world, but um, it looks uh, simple, but also complex, comfortable, but also luxurious. Uh, Italian designers, what can we what can we say? Uh, this one is a little bit burlesque for my taste, and it does connect a little bit with some parts of his architecture. They're probably immensely comfortable, maybe too comfortable, but uh, aesthetically, I think a little bit burlesque. Uh, these are, what can we say? Uh, um, they're not really burlesque, but uh, <laughs> there is a softness here that um, is a little bit, uh, I think, too much emphasized. Uh, but they are, I'm sure, extremely comfortable. Uh, I don't know about this table. A table, of course, is not supposed to be comfortable. I mean, who designs a comfortable table? No, <laughs> unless, I don't know, you imagine other functions for the table, but, you know, a table, nobody asks a plate if the table was comfortable. Uh, I designed also, uh, you know, gadgets, uh, electronic and otherwise, he was famous for his uh, cooperation with Olivetti, the great manufacturer of uh, finely designed and very well functioning uh, typewriters. But now what can we do? They probably ran out of business or they do something else. Who is using typewriters these days? Uh, I had a typewriter, in fact, an Olivetti a long time ago. Uh, yeah, nostalgia, nostalgia. A telephone? Uh, even this kind of telephone, although I wish they come back. I'm, I'm, I'm sick and tired actually of, of, the, of, the, of the mobile phone. I don't like it at all. I don't like mobile phones at all. It was so nice that time when there was a fixed, uh, unmoving phone, just like this one. Also, when you, when you call somebody, just rotating each number was something, I, I, I know I could be accused of nostalgia, but... Uh, uh, I, I know it was a pleasure, actually, you know, uh, to, to dial a number, you know. Uh, now you just click a button and it's, I, I, I don't know. I, I just don't like public phones. I mean, not public phones, uh, mobile phones. This one was always there in the place where it's supposed to be. You knew exactly where it was. Uh, <laughs> I liked it. Although, of course, you, you couldn't put it in your pocket and, and go walking or jogging. Uh, no, it was it was meant for the interior. But this idea to carry a, a phone in your pocket everywhere you go, uh, this continuous availability to so-called communication scares me. I think not you know not every minute you are supposed to you know communicate or be available. There are moments of silence. There are moments when you talk. But this I don't know. It's I think it's something obsessional and manic actually about this, 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 this despair almost to continuously, continuously, continuously communicate, you know, uh, day and night, you know, in the swimming pool, I saw people with a mobile phone, on the bicycle, you know, uh, it's unbelievable, you know. I saw two people, just, they just got married, each one with the iPhone, with a, not iPhone, with a, or iPhone even, you know, with a phone, with a smart, so-called smartphone. Each one, it's obsessional, really. I don't like it. <laughs> Sorry for this outburst of, uh, of, uh, of uh, you know, maybe excessive subjectivity. Back to the designs of the great uh, designer and architect. Yes, he knew how to design. I told you, I already confessed. I like him the most in this picture. And this makes me think, actually, of the picture, that famous picture with Louis Kahn, where... Louis can also illustrate some idea with his hands, with both hands, uh, differently. Uh, here we have uh, uh, the display of the hands is horizontal. In the case of, uh, of, uh, of, uh, of Louis Kahn, uh, vertical. But it, it could be interesting to compare the two pictures. This is, a, I actually think I had this camera. I lost it, who knows? I didn't know it was designed by 
by this important designer uh, from Italy and architect. Uh, was not a great, uh, you know, um, I mean, Fujika, I, I don't think was a great, it was not an expensive camera, but it is uh, exquisitely designed. I, I, I um, yeah, I had this camera in my hands and I think I, I, I bought it from a, you know, a flea market or something for a few dollars, but it's uh, very well designed. And, uh, here again, we see a little bit of that uh, burlesque aspect uh, in terms of design that I mentioned that sometimes this seems to be unable to avoid. Otherwise, there are very interesting, uh, it's an interesting uh, composition, you know, the side of this, uh, uh, of this object. <laughs> Welcome to the world of Lux, Calme Volute, as Baudelaire would say. Uh, and the table, we saw the sketch for this table, and now we'll see three tables kind of, uh, I mean, it's the same table, but uh, you know, different uh, materials or colors or whatever. Um, <laughs> interesting idea, why not? It could be like this as well, of course. And then we are approaching, we are truly approaching the end. I think this is, uh, there will be another image of this, uh, of this chair. And this might be the last image of this uh, presentation. And we see, Again, here, the world of theater brought into conjunction with, uh, with the furniture design. You know, this is a wrapped, uh, is, is, is a curtain in a way, and it introduces, it brings in a little bit of informality. So the geometry of the object is, uh, is softened. And uh, I, I think uh, it's very skillfully done. And the only, uh, you know, problem I might have would, would most surely be the price. I'm sure it is an expensive uh, object. Thank you very much. <laughs>